According to the theory of evolution, the origin and development of the universe and all its systems can be explained solely on the basis of time, chance, and continuing processes. All living things have arisen from a single-celled organism. A second and opposing worldview is the concept of creation. According to the theory of creation, everything in the universe has come into being through the design, purpose, and deliberate acts of a supernatural creator. That means this creator created the universe, the earth, and all life on earth, including all types of plants and animals, as well as humans. Hello, my friends. Welcome to Origins. My name's Don Chapman, and it's my privilege to be your host. Origins is a forum where we take the evidence of science and we use it to validate the truth of creation. And we do that by interviewing some of exciting creation scientists and folks who uh, have done great research and study in this area. Today we have kind of a special show. It's a little different than anything we've ever done. We're going to introduce you to a DVD today called Evolution, the Grand Experiment. And Dr. Carl Warner is with us, who has uh, produced this great video. D Dr. Warner, how good to have you with us. It's so great to be here. Thank you, Don. Now, you're a graduate of the University of Missouri, and you're a physician by trade. Yes. Uh, and uh, you were uh, a physician by 23. You must have been a driven man and... Uh, uh, obviously a very gifted man, but what got you into wanting to talk about evolution? Well, uh, this came to me. I didn't go seeking it. I was in uh, medical school. I was 19 years old. I believed in evolution. And a friend came to me and said, Carl, you believe in evolution? I said, well, yeah. And he says, uh, how do you deal with these problems? And he presented to me three questions that changed my life. He said, you believe that the Big Bang occurred, out of, you know, formed the universe out of the Big Bang. How do you form matter for the universe out of nothingness? And then he you know, showed me that this is a violation of the first law of thermodynamics. And I thought to myself, hmm, that's very interesting. Something from nothing. Something from nothing, and that's a violation. His second question to me was this, Carl, you believe that life formed from chemicals to, to begin evolution. How would you explain this knowing that DNA does not form naturally from chemicals? And I thought to myself, you know, he's right. I, I know this from biochemistry, but I've never applied this to evolution. And proteins don't form naturally, and functional cell membranes don't form naturally. And um, I said, well, I don't know. Then he presented to me the fossil record. He said, Carl, we have hundreds of millions of fossils. Why are there gaps between animal groups that, you know, seemingly go against the theory of evolution? And at that point, I realized I was, uh, I was challenged that there was something wrong with my way of thinking. I believed in evolution, yet he just more or less decimated my Three ideas. Three questions took the pins out from my Took head. the pins out, and now I was confused. I thought, you know what, I have to go look into this thing. Now, there came a point where just instead of just pondering these things in your mind, you began to go out and do research, which eventually led to this, uh, to this DVD. Well, I talked my wife into going out and... Uh, uh, forming a television production company so we could get access to the information. And basically, this allowed us into the dinosaur dig sites, it allowed us into the museums, it allowed us entree to the professors. And we started to go around the world filming interviews, going to the dig sites. We went to um, and interviewed a who's who's list of evolution scientists. Dr. Jo Johansson, who discovered Lucy. We interviewed uh, Dr. Gingrich, who discovered Rhodocetus, the famous Rhodocetus. We interviewed Dr. Hussein, who did the discovery of Ambulocetus. The author of the book, Dinosauria, the curator where Archaeopteryx is found. We not only interviewed them, but then we had them take us and show us their fossil collections. Show us this evidence for evolution that you say is here. We want to see this. We interviewed Dr. Oxnard who was questioning at the time the validity of the fossil Lucy and the late Clark Howell at Berkeley who led the Ethiopian expedition for, uh, in the Oma Valley there. Um, in all, we did approximately 60 scientists uh, and carried out the interviews, but that was only the first phase of this whole thing. 
The second phase was then we went to the dig sites. I wanted to see the fossils, the actual evidence. And so we traveled all over the world. We went to Solnhofen, Germany, where Archaeopteryx was found. And we went to the Iguanodon dig site in Belgium, where they had found the 29 dinosaurs in the coal mine. And we went to Dinosaur Provincial Park, where they had found 10,000 dinosaurs. And we went to Fossil Butte, Wyoming, where they had found one billion fossil fish in the fossil layers there. One billion. We went to Neanderthal dig site and interviewed the curator from the Neanderthal Museum in Metman, Germany. We went to Petrified Forest, uh, where the 10,000 acres of petrified trees are. We went to the Badlands, um, where fossils are found there. We went to Agate Springs um, at, uh, uh, in western United States. We went to Thermopolis, where 200,000 dinosaur bones were found. We went to the Messel dig site in Germany, where 600 bats were found fossilized. Dinosaur National Monument. We went to Mygat Moor. It, it becomes, you know, after a while, the, the list is so long and it, it becomes uh, overwhelming, the amount of information that we collected. And yet, even after visiting all those sites, you weren't done. I wasn't done because then we realized, when you go to the dig sites, you see very few fossils because it takes a while to get them out. We decided then we'd go to the museums and photograph the fossils in the museums that had been taken from these sites. And so we started photographing fossils and, and photographing entire museums. We started and we went to, for example, went to the Carnegie Museum and filmed the fossils there. We went to the Red Path Museum in Montreal. We went to the California Academy of Sciences in San Francisco, the Museum Victoria in Melbourne, and uh, Harvard Peabody Museum. These fossils then became the backbone of our research because now we had the information, the source material, and we could then carry out this experiment to test evolution. Over 100,000 miles. Yep. 60 interviews with some of the most prominent uh, evolutionary scientists in the world. Yes. And then visiting uh, both the dig sites and the museums that yes. house the fossils. Yes. Uh, this is an incredibly extensive research project. You started in 1997, is 1997, that? 1997. And we traveled, uh, you know, to Australia and all throughout Europe, all over North America. Plus, besides this, we also did nature photography. We filmed at the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, yeah. underwater diving there. Uh, we filmed at, uh, uh, in Australia. We went up to Alaska to observe the glaciers. And all the while we're comparing nature, what's going on today, to the fossils and the events that happened in the past. It, it, it's incredible research, and, and, but uh, some fun along the way, I hope. It was a, a great experience. It was a kind of a unique opportunity. And, you know, the public believes that scientists can't be wrong. Scientists know that scientists can be wrong, you know. And I questioned when this all started, is this one of these big finds, like when we discovered that the Earth wasn't flat and it was round, you know, hundreds of years ago, or when uh, Galileo and Copernicus put together that the Earth wasn't the center of our planetary system? Is this one of those big blunders that I've stumbled upon that the whole paradigm is going to have to shift because evolution doesn't work out or do I just not understand it? Knowing this, that scientists can make blunders, I then pursued, I had the openness to pursue this because I tell you what, scientists have been wrong in the past about big things. Prior to Charles Darwin, scientists had some rather strange ideas concerning how life began. They believed that living organisms came into being rapidly and spontaneously over a period of just a few weeks. The scientific community believed in spontaneous generation for 2,000 years. And it is a stark reminder that even a majority of scientists can be wrong. In his classic 17th century description of spontaneous generation, scientist Jan Baptist von Helmont suggested that mice came from dirty underwear. Wanneer je een stuk gedragen ondergoed, if you put a piece of sweaty underwear in an open mouth jar, together with a piece of wheat, after 21 days the ferment coming out of the underwear changed the wheat into mice. 
But what is even more amazing is that the mice are not small or aborted mice, but adult mice emerge. Another evidence offered for spontaneous generation was the rotting meat experiment. 17th century scientists observed that if meat was placed in an open jar, maggots formed on the meat weeks later. They conjectured that life, in the form of maggots, arose spontaneously from rotting meat. But in 1668, Francesco Redi, an Italian physician and scientist, overturned this idea. He suggested this proof of spontaneous generation was nothing more than contamination of the meat by flies. When flies landed on the rotting meat, they laid their eggs. Over time, these eggs grew into maggots. Later, the maggots changed into flies. When scientist Reddy prevented flies from landing on the meat with a piece of cheesecloth, maggots never formed. A third evidence for spontaneous generation was the 19th century pond water experiment. Scientists took pond water, boiled it, and poured it into an open jar. After a few weeks, the sterilized water was now teeming with bacteria. Soon the water became cloudy. Scientists suggested this was proof of spontaneous generation, that bacteria arose spontaneously from the sterile water. They scoffed at anyone who dared to question their conclusions. In 1859, spontaneous generation was finally rejected after the French Academy of Sciences held a contest to see if anyone could definitively prove or disprove the theory. Scientist Louis Pasteur stepped forward. Pasteur theorized that cloudy water did not represent spontaneous generation, rather contamination. He suggested that bacteria in the air seeded the water in the jar. To prove this, he sterilized water in an S-shaped glass. The opened end of the glass pointed upward and allowed air in, but bacteria could only settle in the neck and were prevented from reaching the water. After months of waiting, the liquid in the flask never became cloudy. With this experiment, Pasteur disproved spontaneous generation once and for all, and this first scientific natural explanation for the origin of life collapsed. Today we can learn from the failures of the past. A scientific idea, theory or law may be believed for thousands of years by a majority of scientists, only to be proven wrong. All scientific theories and laws should be open to scrutiny, even the theory of evolution. It's not science unless you can question and falsify it, unless you can say this is false, this is wrong, it's not science. You know, scientists are just as much prone to holding on to old ideas as anyone else. Many of them are very conservative. But there's always a chance with new evidence that we may find that there's a fundamental error in our thinking. You know, no scientist ever says never, and no good scientist ever says always. It comes down to what you bring to the questions to begin with. If you don't want to see things, you're not going to see them. And we're all guilty of not wanting to see certain things. Carl, you said that uh, one of the three things your friend challenged you about that got this whole experiment started was that there were problems in the fossil record. Could you give me an example of some place where there seems to be a gap or a problem? These gaps are problematic throughout the fossil record. I'm just going to show you bats here. 1,000 fossil bats have been collected. Now that's a lot of fossils, and these are beautiful fossils. Now if you would have that many fossils, and if evolution was true, you would expect to find ancestors of, let's say, a ground mammal changing into a bat if you have 1,000 fossil bats. But the problem is, is there's not a single ancestor for any bat. The bats just appear suddenly, almost like it was a creation. Almost like it was created. Mm -hmm. Bats are warm-blooded flying mammals. Some bats use sonar-like echolocation to catch their prey. An amazing 1,000 fossil bats have been collected so far. Many of these are complete bats. Some show breathtaking minute detail, such as wing membranes, fur, and even stomach contents. Despite this rich fossil record, Darwin's predicted intermediates have not been found. There are no fossils showing a ground mammal similar to a mouse 
slowly changing into a flying mammal, a bat. You would guess that there'd be some sort of a bat precursor, but once again, nothing. Bingo, they just show up. And so, I mean, as you might guess that, you know, there are certain people that think they were specially created. They're, they actually are kind of a problem with the creationists who like to, you know, if things were created, here's a, here's a very highly complex mammal with all these adaptations, and bingo, they just show up at some particular moment in time fully formed as a bat. Obviously, we evolutionary biologists and paleontologists don't believe that, but at this point, we don't have a good fossil ancestor for them. When did bats When does it theorize? Well, it's also, that must have happened also in the, in the lowest tertiary. But we have no evidence for, for this evolution. Also, the bats appear perfectly developed. We don't have any non-flying bats. And so we can't pull something out of that, any kind of information out of that that tells us how they might ev have evolved. What period of time did the bats evolve, do we think? Uh, we have no um, fossil records of um, bats during the uh, Cretaceous uh, period. And this means that we are only depending on speculation when it started and what happened uh, in that time. Of course, when we have uh, the oldest bats, like Icaronycteris, uh, they were completely developed in their morphology and their uh, flight apparatus, and also the mesal bats were completely developed. So, uh, we can only speculate. Opponents of evolution have seized on this lack of evolutionary intermediates in the fossil record. They ask, how many more bats would have to be collected before one declares the absence of ancestors a reality? For them, the fossil evidence of bats clearly speaks against evolution. Wow, that's, that's fascinating. Now, bats aren't the only animal where we have a problem finding ancestors or transitional forms, isn't it? That's also true with fish. Fish are yet another example. In fact, the whole fossil record is the same pattern. Let me tell you about fish. They have collected 500,000 fossil fish. 500,000. That's an awful lot of fossils. They've collected 100 million invertebrates you know, animals without backbones, but they can't connect the invertebrates to fish. The fish just suddenly appear. Scientist John Long is one of Australia's most eminent paleontologists and is the head of science at the prestigious Museum of Victoria in Melbourne. He has studied fossil fish for years. He reports that the fossil fish collections of the world are immense. How many fossil fish are there in museums? Well, I visited some of the biggest museums in the world to study their fossil fish collections, such as the Natural History Museum in London and the American Museum of Natural History. And uh, I'd say conservatively there'd be hundreds of thousands, probably um, maybe up to half a million. Although fish have the most abundant fossil record of all the vertebrates, there are no fossils showing invertebrates, such as jellyfish or starfish, slowly changing into fish nor do the fossils show the formation of a spinal cord over time, as Darwin predicted. There's a lot of debate over the origins and diversity of the first jaw, jawed fishes, the nathostomes as we call them. That's still one of the great mysteries and problems to be solved in vertebrate evolution. Despite a 150 year search for evolutionary ancestors, every fish family appears suddenly in the fossil record. Every major kind of fish that we know anything about appears fully formed. There's not a trace of an ancestor for any of these creatures, and there are no transitional forms suggesting that these major kind of fishes evolve from a common ancestor. Now, evolutionists know that. They say it and it's true, but they believe in evolution anyhow. But evolution is impossible. The origin of fishes, that's the origin of vertebrates. That would be the most astounding, important event in all of evolutionary history. We should have book after book after book written about the origin of vertebrates. We should have picture after picture of all these transitional forms. There's nothing. The fact that the vertebrates, the fishes, appear fully formed, no trace of ancestors, no trace of transitional forms, destroys the theory of evolution. Evolution cannot be true. Scientists who support evolution still hold out hope that they will eventually find these fossils. The evolution of fish is still very um, 
much debated amongst paleontologists. And I think that within the next 10 years we'll probably get some resolution on the origin and interrelationships of the major groups of fishes. All we really know at the moment is that the bony fishes came from one of these primitive groups, but we don't really know which one. So there's still mystery and some debate over where the true bony fishes came from. Scientists who oppose evolution suggest the absence of fish ancestors in the presence of 500,000 fossil fish speaks resoundingly against evolution. There just aren't any ancestral fossils. Uh, we've looked at, at bats and we've looked at fish. Are there other animal examples? Yeah, we went and interviewed all of the seal evolution experts in the world and we said, how many fossil seals have you found? 1,000 fossil seals have been collected. That's a lot of fossils. And then we said, could you show us the animals that evolved from what they think is a skunk went into a seal? Can you show us these transitional fossils? And there are none. Skunks become seals. That's what they said. But there's no fossils but to no show But no fossils it. to show it. Seals are often mistaken for sea lions, but they are an entirely different family of mammals. Unlike mm. sea lions, mm. Seals move on the ground like a caterpillar in an undulating pattern. Also, seals do not have visible ears. Evolution scientists believe seals evolved from the skunk and otter family. Fossid seals are allied to a completely separate group of carnivores, the mustelids, the skunks and otters. Over 5,000 fossil seals have been identified, but all of the predicted evolutionary ancestors are missing. We don't have such a material. We already can say this is true seals according to morphology of the bones. We cannot say, I don't know what is this, it has so many features. And it means it's not a time where we can find this missing link. According to opponents of evolution, finding 5,000 fossil seals without evolutionary ancestors contradicts the theory of evolution. So, the evolutionists aren't getting any help from the seals. There's no ancestors there either. No ancestors for seals, no ancestors for bats, no ancestors for fish. It goes on and on and on. And that's pretty much a pattern through the whole fossil the record. The whole fossil record goes yes. that way, yes. Now, surely dinosaurs would be the saving proof here because dinosaurs are so key to evolution, right? Uh, what, do you, what about that? Is the opposite true? You know, most people, when they go through a museum and see all these dinosaurs, they think, oh, this is proof of evolution. But I hold a different view. Are you aware that all of the major animal and plant groups have been found with dinosaurs? In other words, the fauna of the animals with the dinosaurs was similar to today. For example, they found ducks with dinosaurs, flamingos, avocets, hedgehogs, possums, all of the plant groups, all of the animal phyla have been found with dinosaurs. Now, number one, that's a fallacy that the faunas were different. And number two, they don't have ancestors for any of the dinosaur species. They have collected, Don, 100,000 fossil dinosaurs. That's a huge number. 3,000 of them are full skeletons. And yet when we interviewed the scientists, they said we do not have a single ancestor for a, any of the dinosaur species. Nothing. The idea of dinosaurs roaming our planet seems almost imaginary. But evidence of their existence is undeniable. Some of the plant-eating dinosaurs were over 90 feet long and weighed 30 tons. Meat-eating dinosaurs had huge serrated teeth and powerful jaws that could rip apart any foe. Paleontologists have recovered 3,000 dinosaur skeletons, plus bones and teeth from 100,000 dinosaurs. The remains are so voluminous, they cannot all be displayed, many being relegated to museum basements. Despite this enormous collection of remains, no ancestors have been found for any dinosaur species, even Tyrannosaurus rex. Wherever we try to put Tyrannosaurus in, in the phylogeny of the, the branching history of theropod dinosaurs, they have a long missing record. And uh, we're going to find that record one of these days. We're certainly lacking information um, that ties together meat-eating dinosaurs and all the rest of the dinosaurs. Even the plant-eating Ornithischian dinosaurs have this same fossil pattern. A plethora of fossils, but no direct ancestors. 
we haven't really any idea how um, the, the whole other group of dinosaurs called Ornithischians, exactly the timing of the, the, and the way they branched off. We've, we've got nothing there yet. There's a huge gap. Despite finding hundreds of skulls for the plant-eating dinosaur Triceratops, no direct evolutionary ancestors have been found. Triceratops heads are just pretty common. Um, I've heard tell that there are at least 50 different individuals just based on skulls alone, and that's probably complete skulls. And who knows how many uh, partial skulls would increase that number. I suspect we probably know, you know, a hundred or hundreds of Triceratops from their skulls. Many dinosaur evolution charts, such as this one from the Chicago Field Museum, imply that the ancestors of dinosaurs have been discovered. But when the solid lines are overlaid with the actual number of dinosaurs found, the chart tells a very different story. Opponents of evolution suggest these museum diagrams are often misleading and do not reflect the fossil evidence. The diagrams don't always reflect the fossil evidence. Boy, that's a powerful uh, thing to hear. Mm. Carl, what an incredible job you've done as the executive producer of this. I, I just think you, we, the church and, and uh, really anyone interested in truth is indebted to the hundreds of thousands of miles that you've traveled and the, and the effort and the work that you've done. What a tremendous thing you've done. Uh, it's a joy to have you here on uh, Origins. I hope that many of our folks will get the book, get the DVD, get the study materials, especially those with children, that they'll use them to at least open up minds to seek truth and to ask the right questions. Thank you so much Thank for you so much. your great work. It's a, gr it's a great privilege to have you here. Folks, you know, just because scientists say it's so doesn't mean it's so. We've seen many, uh, many examples uh, in history where uh, scientists work from wrong uh, presuppositions for a long time until the truth sort of uh, re uh, reset the dial and made them think again. And I think that may be true with the theory of evolution and it may be time for people to realize that God is our creator. You know, it's God's view he created you. That should be your worldview too. We hope to see you again here soon on Origins and until then, God bless you my friend. Thank you for watching this edition of Origins. If you'd like a copy of the PowerPoint information presented today, you can download a PDF file of program number 1007 from our website at www.originstv.org. Or for a DVD of this series, send a $12 donation to cover shipping and handling and write to Origins, program number 1007, Cornerstone Television, Wall, Pennsylvania, 15148. Origins is made possible by the faithful prayers and the financial support of you, our Cornerstone Television family.